So hi, hi everyone again. <laughs> Hello and welcome and welcome to another Saturday, uh, Saturday live stream. Well, for some of you, it might already be Sunday. We've got again, uh, as I've seen in the chat here, people and enthusiasts from all over the world. I would like to welcome you again. And uh, as always, uh, I would like uh, to kindly ask you uh, if you have any sound problems or is, if there are any technical problems, then please uh, say it in the chat. And I've seen that there are already a lot of people, not a lot, but several people who have already posted something in the chat from all over the world. And uh, yeah, if you have been here in this uh, live stream already before, then you probably already know that it's become a tradition to quickly say from where you are. <laughs> Microscopy um, is a hobby that is enjoyed all over the world. And it's, I think, always a very nice uh, thing uh, to see that uh, people from all over the world uh, like uh, to engage in this hobby here. So uh, what I will be doing uh, um, is the following in the first couple of minutes. I will, I'll be reading um, again off some of the greetings in the chat because over the first uh, five minutes or so more and more people will be joining the live stream and uh, I want to give those uh, people also a little bit of time to join. So I'll simply read off uh, all of the greetings uh, starting off from greetings from Stormy Honolulu <laughs> in, in Hawaii. Okay. Um, and uh, there is uh, also from New Zealand, uh, from Lebanon, from Italy, from Norway. Okay. Um, yeah. Also, hello from Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. Where it's uh, early morning on Sunday in Vietnam. Yeah. Wow. 3.30 a.m. I cannot believe it that there are even people joining right in the middle of the night. <laughs> so of course, uh, um, if uh, some of you might uh, not be able to join at these times um, and uh, therefore the video, of course, will be um, available online um, afterwards as well. Well, right now I'm streaming from Central Europe uh, and uh, it's right now 9.30 um, in the evening from where I am. Okay, so yeah, also from the Netherlands, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I can hear you. Okay, sound is good. That's very nice. I can hear you. Very good. Okay, good evening from the Netherlands. Uh, hello from Saudi Arabia. Hello, do you remember me? Well, I've got so many people um, in the previous uh, months that I uh, almost am look, uh, losing a little bit uh, an overview here. Hello from the UK. Um, guten Abend. Okay, uh, greetings uh, from Vienna in Austria, <laughs> from South Africa, West Coast, the United States, the Netherlands, the United States, California. Wow, Germany, UK. I cannot believe it. Berlin. Okay, Sweden. Hello from the UK again. And uh, hello, I don't know if uh, I can ask you questions here, but here I go about a microscope and it still didn't come. So I'm researching from your videos and I have uh, issues. So how can I... Uh, obtain the solvent. Okay, I think I'm going to answer some of those questions later on as well. Hello from Turkey, from South Africa and also from Massachusetts. Okay, so I think we're just going to get uh, started right now. We're going to dive in. For those of you who are new to this uh, uh, to this live stream, um, yes, please, uh, I would invite you to um, yeah post questions in the chat, even if the questions are a little bit off topic. Um, this basically means uh, as long as they're somehow microscopy related, um, it's uh, going to be fine. Um, I might not be able to respond to all of those questions, uh, but maybe someone else in the chat is able to do so. Okay. Um, so what I will be doing is, is I will be, um, yeah, simply starting off and then I will be going back uh, to the chat um, every now and then. So first of all, what are we going to be looking at uh, today? Um, well, actually, I intended uh, to, this was my original plan, to use uh, the, today's live stream to show you a little bit some slide preparation techniques uh, to make some permanent mounts or some dry mounted permanent slides and so on. I still want to do that in the future. However, this uh, does need a little bit of preparation time. And uh, the, over the last couple of days, I was quite busy in my work and didn't have time to prepare. So what I decided to do today is the following. Um, I found out that some of my water samples that I'm going to show you um, a few more here. Some of my water samples contain some interesting microorganisms and microanimals. And I would like uh, to look at some of those water samples today. And uh, specifically, I also want to show you this little hay infusion here. I'm also going to tell you how you can make one. You've got to be a little bit careful with those. And uh, the other water samples that I have over here, I did not put under the microscope yet. OK, um, there is something special with those, namely that the pond water and the algae that I had in those little glass jars here uh, completely dried up. 
Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, they completely dried up. I, was, uh, let, I let the water evaporate. And then after they were dry for a few days, I added again some water um, and I left it stand now for, I don't know, maybe one or two weeks. And I would like to see now which microorganisms uh, are now able to grow despite the dryness. Now, uh, I think uh, the important thing is the following here. Many microorganisms or most of them did or maybe all of them did not survive, probably did not survive the drying process. And for this reason, I just wanted to see what is able to survive or live. Maybe nothing, okay? But um, those uh, two uh, water samples over here, I kept uh, fresh and there should be uh, plenty of microorganisms in, in there, but probably not so much in those. But that's what I want to find out, okay? So as you can see, not all of the things that I'm actually uh, doing here in the live stream um, I've actually prepared. Sometimes there is also a little bit of uh, a surprise uh, here as well. So I'm going to jump back again uh, over to the chat. Hello from Massachusetts, uh, from, from, okay, from Turkey. Okay, um, yeah, Rotifer questions. Hello from Spain. Okay, from Missouri, the United States, from Spain again. Okay, yeah, so that's uh, very great. So um, a few um, comments here, and um, because uh, some people also wanted to know a little bit is how do you store water samples? Uh, what happens if you don't have a pond, um, or if let's say it's winter time and you still would like to have samples for microscopy? Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit um, about this. Um, this here is a so-called a hay infusion and this is actually the sample where I found quite a few rotifers. Okay, uh, rotifers are micro animals, and I will talk about them. Yeah, uh, later. I mean, that's the whole point of the um, of the live stream today. And making a hay infusion is relatively simple. What you do is, is you take a little bit of dry grass, some hay, and you add pond water. And the pond water, um, or some, uh, also maybe some sediment from the pond water, not tap water. Okay. Um, and the what's going to happen is, is that the grass, the hay, is going to serve as a food source for whatever microorganisms, and then they're going to start to grow. Yeah? And then um, I left this one here for a couple of weeks now. And what you're going to see is, is you're going to see a change in microorganisms over several days. Okay, um, so and then you have um, always uh, plenty of uh, yeah, specimens to observe. Um, when making hay infusions like this, you have to be careful like any time when you're working with unknown microorganisms. So I had some mixed feelings uh, because in my, um, uh, my uh, pr previous videos and also on my webpage, I actually warned a little bit, you should be careful not to make hay infusions. And uh, yeah, generally, if you stick to the uh, basic safety guidelines, it should be okay. But don't forget one thing that you have decomposing organic matter in here. And this means that there are many, many bacteria growing. Okay, um, bacteria where you don't know what they are. So you have to be a little bit careful just also when you spoil food, for example, you have to be careful, right? And when food becomes moldy, you do not want to inhale the spores either. And um, basically decomposing material, um, of course, is also a source of bacteria. However, um, what you should do is, is not add too much water because um, if you add too much water then the bottom uh, part um, has too little oxygen. So what you want to make sure is you want to make sure that there's lots of oxygen able to reach uh, all of parts here. And for this reason, don't use too much water and keep it, uh, keep uh, the lid away. And uh, then basically you will see that uh, over time, the water is going to start to turn cloudy. This is a sign that there are a lot of bacteria in there. And um, after a couple of days, further days, uh, maybe the cloudiness is going to disappear as other larger microorganisms and also the rotifers uh, are going to start growing and they feed on the bacteria, right? And uh, as a matter of fact, right now the water is, yeah, as you can see, a little bit greenish. There's some sediment, the, yeah, the grass is decomposing, um, and um, yeah, the rotifers really like it a lot here, okay? So, but really make sure that the bacterial concentration is kept low and make sure that whatever um, you've got in here that it does not touch your fingers. Uh, yeah, the skin is a pretty good protective layer, but you don't want to have any wounds in here. Um, yeah, because you don't know what you're actually growing here, yeah? So, um, I'm going to always jump back again here, okay? Um, Hello from Arkansas in the United States. Uh, hello from an astronomer who also wants to learn microscopy. Ah, yes, uh, I used to do uh, amateur and hobby astronomy. Uh, yeah, also quite a lot. Still interested, yeah? Do you know what's the most common water organism? Ah, the most common water organism depends very, very much on the water sample. But there's one thing that I can assure you, bacteria can be found pretty much any, everywhere. 
okay? A bacteria very uh, common, very ubiquitous. This means it can be found in many different places. But of course, different places have different bacteria. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are those guidelines? Um, which guidelines uh, did I uh, talk about? Um, did I, I just forgot what I actually just mentioned? Maybe the guidelines of making uh, making those um, uh, pond water samples is, is that you want to really make sure that there is enough oxygen present because if there is not, then bacteria, anaerobic bacteria specifically, they might start to grow and they kill off everything else. Yeah. Um, do not spill it um, um, and uh, wipe it off uh, carefully and uh, make sure that um, is Essentially, you do not put any, um, that's a bad thing, don't put any meat or any uh, animal material um, in here, only plant material. Because if you've got bacteria that are able to break down animal proteins, then those uh, bacteria probably could also um, yeah, grow on human beings. And that's something that you don't want. Okay. So, hello, star friend. Yes. Okay. Uh, I remember seeing you in the last live stream. Yes, I have a live stream every week. Okay. So, um, yeah, it would be a rotter for any ciliates. It makes sense. Hello from the Dominican Republic. Okay. Um, yeah, and I always wash my hands. I also would do that. Yeah. Um, any advice uh, to cultivate water bears? Um, yeah, grow them on moss. Uh, just to take yourself a moss sample and keep it moist. Uh, they really love it there. Okay. But I think I've been talking a lot now, so I'm just gonna get started. And I think uh, that more and more people have already joined. Yeah. So um, simply a, a microscope slide. Um, I've got some cover classes over here. Um, it's a question of, yeah, of personal preference. Um, I like to use um, those uh, large cover glasses. Okay. Uh, most of the cover glasses are smaller. Like for example, the one I have over here. Yeah, this, that's a small one. Yeah, 18 by 18 millimeters. Um, yeah, it's it's a question of personal preference. Those large cover glasses do have a disadvantage. Okay, though, and that is especially this one over here. It goes all the way to the edges of the microscope slide. So this means that it's quite easy for water to spill over <laughs> and to go on the stage um, of the microscope. Um, yeah, microscope stage. So yeah, they do have a disadvantage. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a small sample here, and usually what I do is uh, yeah to grab a little bit of, of, of grass. Uh, it is all too big. Yeah, something like this. Ah, you can see it here. Yeah, and then what I do is, is I simply dip it. Yeah, it dip it on the slide. Okay, you can actually see that there is a, it's already starting to become a little bit greenish. Um, that is possibility number one. Possibility number two is the following. Um, I've got a pipette. You can also use a, a plastic pipette that you have. A, this one is quite convenient. So, yeah, and you just go in here and you grab a little bit of, uh, yeah, some some of the sample and you put it here directly. But uh, very often, very often, uh, those rotifers they like to accumulate on solid material, um, and uh, therefore they like to be on the leaves. But yeah, I think I've been shaking this around so much now that they have come off. And I can also see over here. Maybe you cannot see it quite well, but uh, actually it does look. Uh, quite a little bit green and then I simply put the microscope slide here on top yeah. and yeah as I told you before yeah, you might want to clean your fingers a little bit sometimes what I do is um, as well as is I actually um, remove some of the excess water by tapping the side here yeah. um, because I don't want to oop, I shifted the yeah, cover glass so and let's uh, give it a try okay um, at least <laughs> yesterday, I got uh, quite nice, uh, uh, quite nice samples here. So I put it under the microscope, uh, and um, yeah, let's hope for the best. I need to flip out the condenser. I need to put away the thing here, and uh, yeah, that's uh, basically now with the four times um, objective. You can see over here in this on the side. Where is this? Where's my arrow? Here, the, here the arrow is here on top. You can always see on the side which uh, objective I'm, I'm using. Okay. Um, so this is not a four times uh, objective. Yeah? And uh, yeah, those uh, are plenty of rotifers. They're still quite small at this uh, magnification. Let's go, yeah. Um, but they um, are decomposed. They like to decompose. Okay, so let's have a look here. Yeah, yeah and there are, there are several of them here. But yeah, there, there are more here. Okay, it's a little bit of, of luck, I guess, uh, where you can actually, uh, yeah. Were there more of them? And I'm just going to go up a little bit here. And let's go up with the, yeah. And uh, of course we want to focus. 
Okay, and here they are. Uh, rotifers are pretty common. Uh, m m many of you who are a little bit into microscopy probably have already seen them before. Um, but uh, I was quite happy because I found quite a few of them here in this uh, sample. Okay, all the different uh, different types. You know what I'm going to do is I might actually um, kind of change the... Okay, go up a little bit. I just, uh, I'm not quite happy with... Uh, uh, with the shutter speed of my camera right now, okay? But let's go up again, and then I can tell you a little bit about rotifers, okay? So, yeah. Rotifers are actually one of the um, smallest animals known. So these are considered to be true animals. Um, so it's actually uh, a little bit a question of definition of whether you actually want to call them microorganisms. Strictly speaking, they are not, uh, per definition, they are not microorganisms. <laughs> even though they are microscopically small, because they're made of multiple cells, okay? Um, yeah, and they like to move around, and uh, they eat uh, all sorts of small material, like, for example, bacteria, cellular debris, and so on, and so on, okay? Um, so, um, I'm new here. What microscope do I use? Well, I use a compound microscope, and uh, as a matter of fact, um, yeah, the brand is really not so important, I think, because uh, most compound or pretty much all compound microscopes these days, uh, when they um, yeah, of the mid range, are, are able to show you these things. However, what might be a little bit different is you might be a little bit uh, surprised, <laughs> some of you, uh, about the blue background color. Um, well, I'm not using special filters here. Is uh, I've got special optics. Uh, so when you are looking at the uh, with your microscope, most likely you're going to see it like this. Okay, regular bright field. So that is the way that most of you will actually see uh, those rotifers. Right, and they're also quite fine. Yeah, this is called bright field, but I have a, a special technique uh, called DIC. Yeah, and that's why it gives it a, a this uh, bluish background. And uh, by shifting a prism, I'm also able to change the colors here. Yeah, it's, yeah. I got myself this microscope because I'm making live streams and videos, and uh, um, it's a, a little bit easier um, to see the things if the color contrast is, is stronger. Okay, so um, yeah, this is now the 20 times I'm going up to 40 times, um, and of course I have to always readjust a little bit the yeah uh, intensity, uh, the yeah light intensity. Yeah, and uh, those rotifers, what they have is is they have of course a foot with which they're able to attach to the surface, and on the head. Uh, what they have is, is they have, um, you're able to see this, uh, yeah, a so-called a ring of cilia um, that are basically moving. And with that, they're able to generate a water stream uh, with which uh, they're able to yeah, move particles uh, to the mouth. Okay, so here it is. Um, maybe it's a little, still a little bit too dark. Okay, so um, a short explanation now of what I'm talking about. That's why I do have an arrow. That's, of course, the foot um, of the rotifer over here. Um, this is uh, basically the head um, where you see those little tiny hair, um, the cilia that are beating to generate this water stream. That's why they are also referred to as wheeled animals, um, like because those two uh, yeah, rings of cilia over here are like a wheel. And where is the mouth, you want to know? The mouth is this part here. Um, if you actually see this, uh, yeah, it almost looks like it's pumping, uh, but that is actually the, it's known as the mastax. Uh, and this is uh, where also the food is being sucked in. So it's somehow generating this water stream to uh, you know, take up the food and uh, yeah, then it's digesting it here. Yeah. So I'm, as always, as we enjoy the picture of this rotifer here, I'm going to go um, back again uh, to the, the comments. Okay, can you, uh, uh, yeah, the BX53, you're actually able to see it over here, uh, over this camera. Okay, um, if you want to see the microscope, if you just Google it um, from the Olympus, uh, um, or from the Olympus site, yeah? and uh, about the cost, well, you, uh, the thing is the following: it really depends on on, on the on the features that you want it to have, because uh, those microscopes are not sold out of the box, but you have to specify which uh, optics you want to have and 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 all these things, and depending on that, uh, you're able to configure your own microscope. Yeah. Um, so um, those brand microscopes are sold differently and this of course also de uh, determines the price. Yeah. So uh, the price range can be from two. Yeah. Um, do you remember me from the last live stream? Yep, uh, from the name maybe. Are microscope slides and cover glass sizes standardized? What are standards are there? Um, yeah, they are um, uh, standardized. 
um, there are, um, I have to actually, yeah, if you look at it over here, um, it's about two point, it's actually in inches. Um, so it's about 25 millimeters by 75. So it's three inches by one inch. Okay, that is uh, uh, pretty much uh, more or less the standard size. Um, and uh, then concerning the cover glasses, there are different sizes, really. From cover glasses, um, there are really different sizes. But generally, the thickness of the cover glass is approximately um, 0 0.15 to 0 0.17 millimeters. Yeah, so the thickness. Right? But from concerning the size, you, it's a difficult for you to see it now. Okay, um, they Really, you can get pretty much any size that you want. Um, yeah, um, and uh, the thickness of the microscope slide is not so important. Yeah, it does not have an impact on the quality of the image. But if you buy microscope slides, um, uh, there are different ones that are. Some of them are polished on the side so that you do, cannot cut yourself. These ones over here, for example, have a, a forty-five degree angle. I just quickly show you. Okay, uh, just over here. Where is it? Yeah, they have a difficult to see again, 45 degree angle over here so that you cannot cut yourself. And what I usually do is they're a little bit, maybe a little bit more expensive, but I actually recycle them. I wash them and then reuse them. Okay. So um, let me go again over here. Um, uh, well, I have to find it. Wouldn't it make more sense to use a pipette and take small water sample? Um, yeah, I don't know now what you refer. Oh, you mean, uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you, you can use a pipette uh, because I've been using tweezers to take a, a small sample. Both works. Yeah. There are so many people who I have seen from the last live stream. Yes, lots of rotifers. Okay. Um, I'm using a compound microscope here. Yeah. I've never seen that many rotifers before. I heard from some other microscopists that they had uh, some good results making permanent slides using an UV hardling adhesive called loca glue. Oh, that is an interesting one. Okay. Um, a little bit about the, while we <laughs> enjoy some of the rotifers at a higher magnification, just a, a couple of uh, comments here. Um, there is a so-called, um, yeah, there are uh, mounting media available uh, or glues available or also nail polish available, which hardens when you put ultraviolet light on it. Okay, um, so that is uh, possible. I um, have not experimented very much with those, um, but uh, that is also something that I've heard. Uh, I would say that's something that you can try out. Okay, they look like a mixture of a caterpillar snail and a squid. <laughs> Rotifer cell count is constant. Um, yes, the thing is, is that uh, rotifers, just like uh, uh, just like water bears, tardigrades, um, have uh, per species um, a, a fixed uh, cell count. Um, so what I read somewhere that uh, one of those rotifers has approximately a thousand cells, but this number is fixed. In human beings and other animals, for example, different humans have different number of cells, of course, depending on the size that they have and so on. Um, but for rotifers and other one of uh, some other micro animals like tardigrades, this number is fixed. Um, and uh, so of course, there's also a reason why scientists uh, study, use them as model organisms to study developmental biology. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's uh, yeah. Hello from Tennessee. Yes. Uh, wow. Lots of comments. <laughs> uh, how do rotifers reproduce? Ha. Yeah. This is the question. This is the question that I actually wanted to uh, talk about because that's a really interesting one. Um, rotifers are parthenogenic, so I need to explain this term a little bit. This was actually a little bit of a of a mystery also for scientists. Um, rotifers are mostly females. And uh, this basically means that rotifers are able to reproduce from unfertilized egg cells. Um, so this is kind of uh, when scientists discovered this, uh, this caused them quite a bit of headache. Um, and I need to, I want to do a little bit of biology um, explanation here because I think it's, it's interesting and also important. And this was actually also one of the topics that I wanted to talk about anyway. Ah, look, here's another rotifer. <laughs> Okay, um, it is like this that um, the point of um, in in nature, the point of sexual reproduction is, is that every generation is genetically different from the parent generation. We see this in humans and in other animals as, as well. I mean, I myself, of course, am genetically different from my parents, but I'm genetically similar enough to be a human being, obviously, right? Uh, this is so, you need to, there has to be this balance, obviously. You need to be able to produce a functioning organism of the next generation, obviously. Um, but this organism should also be genetically different. And why should it be genetically different? This is important so that the species with every generation able to re-adapt to a changing environment. 
the environment is never constant it's always changing and uh, by making sure that every generation is different from the previous generation uh, therefore um, the species as such is able to survive in a changing environment this is one of the reasons why um, the scientists uh, at the beginning um, when they discovered uh, um, the, um, the whole thing they kind of were wondering um, yeah why is there actually sexual reproduction in nature in the first place I mean isn't it much easier and faster simply to only reproduce by cell division asexually okay you have one cell and you divide in two and then you've got two cells why don't don't all living things do that and they found out later on is that this has a significant disadvantage you're able the advantage is is uh, those organisms are able to reproduce very quickly very fast just divide you don't need a mating partner but the problem is is that the offspring the next generation is genetically the same and they found out that um, I don't know what methods they use that uh, organisms that don't have a very effective way to reproduce sexually are not able to survive very long as a species and now all of a sudden you've got those rotifers here which primarily re reproduce asexually because they develop out of an unfertilized egg cell and this caused quite a bit of a headache for the scientists because it says well how were they then able to survive yeah, because in this case the, the next generation is genetically the same as the previous one and then they found out and I recently read a, a paper a scientific paper on this um, and uh, they found out is that those rotifers what they do is they have other ways to change their DNA so what they're able to do is they're doing able to do something called horizontal gene transfer so they're somehow able to take up and incorporate foreign DNA directly into their own DNA so you see they kind of bypassed um, this this uh, yeah, this need for for having um, yeah, sexual reproduction. So you see, I had to uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you're interested in all of these <laughs> biological details. I, I personally just consider this uh, fascinating. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll see. Yeah, um, I'll go back. Uh, a little bit to the more practical parts of microscopy but you see uh, this is where the biology teacher <laughs> again started to, uh, to come out of me yeah um, yeah um, are my objectives dry or oil I have both okay um, I'm only using right now dry um, um, objectives I just wanted to show you here um, the next objective over here this would be an oil immersion objective okay I'm not using immersion oil now and without immersion oil, the quality of the picture is not very good. Well, it's still okay. But that is now a 100 times oil immersion objective. Yeah. And uh, yeah, um, the image quality would much be, be much better um, if I were to use immersion oil. Uh, beautiful, actually, right now, because now you can see um, yeah, the, the ring of cilia here, the mass tax, with it, which is the mouth, yeah, and all of the particles which are swirled around, uh, probably bacteria and other things, yeah, by the cilia over here. Yeah. Um, so I have both uh, of these, but I prefer using the so-called dry objectives. Yeah. So that's, uh, let's go back to the 60 times over here, and uh, where is the focus? Ah, uh, here we go. Here it is. Okay. Um, yeah, wheel beer. Yes, uh, I seem to remember last. Uh, okay, sorry for the late. Yes, I, okay, generally comments. Hello from Kuwait. Yes, hello back. Now I've got it. It reminds me of the geoduck. Ah, okay. Is, an, uh, is the antimi antimicrobial properties of brass observable? Sure, but maybe a video, maybe a hole in the thin. Um, yes, yes, it is. Ha, ah, yes. Um, the question over here from Jared uh, Mason here on the, on the side is, is um, the antimicrobial properties of certain metals is can this be shown and as a matter of fact yes I've, um, I've, I saw something very interesting uh, a couple of years ago and I think in my main YouTube channel I even made a video of this and that is, is that in a, a fountain uh, ba basically were um, in, in, in a park people were throwing copper coins into yeah, into this uh, fountain, right? People, uh, for traditional reasons, they just threw money into that. And uh, you could see that those coins were on the bottom of the fountain, of the water fountain. And there were algae, a green layer of algae was growing, of course, on the side and everywhere, but not there and surrounding there where there were coins. So there was the coin in the middle, and then there was an area around the coin which was not green. So the copper 
from the metal, from the coins, actually um, dissolved a little bit and prevented the growth of algae directly around the coin. So yes, there is uh, metals do have uh, antimicrobial properties. Yeah, um, and uh, I could actually see this quite nicely, even with the other mi without a microscope. You just had to look at it, and every coin had this area around it where an algae did not grow. It was very, very uh, remarkable. Yeah. Is that the heart beating? No, this is um, not the heart. This is known as the mastax, which is uh, the mouth. Okay, um, that's uh, basically uh, this place over here. Yeah, I think it's even more specific. Yeah. Yes, okay. I would like to know who counted the rotter for cells. Um, um, I don't know how you do that, uh, but I can imagine that maybe by using certain staining techniques, you can stain the DNA um, of the nucleus and then you just count the nuclei. That could be one thing, yeah? but I'm guessing. Yeah? Can rotifers see? Um, look, I'm gonna guess now, I suppose not. And the reason is, is because I do not see an eye and I know that I do not see an eye because eyes usually are dark in color because they need to absorb light and therefore they are dark. Okay. And because I do not see uh, a dark spot on the rod to fur, for this reason, I probably would guess that they are not able to see. However, <laughs> I have to be careful here. I'm speculating right now. There are quite a few animals um, which do not have eyes, but which are still light sensitive because some of where on their skin, they have uh, light sensitive cells. Okay. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm speculating right now. Yeah? So I would probably say that they cannot see in the traditional sense, but maybe some of them are light sensitive. I wouldn't know that. Yeah. Okay. I've not seen a geoduck yet, at least not to my knowledge. Yeah? A little off topic, I got a new microscope last Monday. I've spent every day of this week with a uh, microscopy session and I want to thank Oliver for helping me choose this microscope and I want to thank you back for the thank you. <laughs> okay, um, Okay. lots of comments here. Okay. I noticed that there are two red spots on my microscope. Really, if, if you could, I don't know, maybe, maybe I cannot see them, uh, but if they have red spots, maybe these are eyes. I, honestly, I think that's, that's something I, I'd like to research myself now. Okay. Uh, do I have a fixed calendar for live streams? Like, is there a way for me to know when you're going on live stream? I go every Saturday at the same time. Um, I go on a live stream. Um, and um, on different topics, sometimes uh, more microscopy related, sometimes a little bit more technical. So what I'm going to do now is the following. Um, I'm going to, I, because I've been talking quite a bit now and I want to also show you the other water samples, but um, I decided to do the following. Now I just wanted to go a little bit off topic again and just show you something else what I've got here, a little uh, recommendation. Um, yeah, you know, of course, all of you know what this is here. These are my, yeah, because... I need reading glasses, okay? Um, so that is not the interesting thing, but what is more interesting is are those boxes here. Look what I've got here. Here's one, obviously, for my glasses. I've got another one over here, yeah? Another box over here. Um, they can be bought quite cheaply, okay? Um, I've got one over here. Now you're wondering why am I showing them to you, okay? And look, now that is now the answer to the miracle. I found out that those uh, boxes uh, for eyeglasses just have the right size um, to take a, make a little mic take along microscopy uh, sample box. So I always carry it along, and if I happen to find something interesting that I would like to take home, well, here are the necessary tools. Okay, and it even has the space for one of those plastic tubes here. Just uh, thought that I want to share this with you um, because I do have other boxes as well, but they're kind of large. I don't know if you want to use. Those, I don't know, look, I'm using a Tupperware plastic boxes with a lid. I'm just using this now as a trash box uh, for used microscope slides before I clean them. But I found actually those, uh, those boxes uh, for, for eyeglasses uh, also quite, uh, quite useful actually. Um, and I just would like to yeah, share this idea with you. Um, the problem with those is, is that the scissors cannot fit. Um, why scissors? Because sometimes there are filamentous algae that I pull out of a pond and they're very long. Okay, And then I usually just cut them off with the scissors. Huh? And of course, uh, some, some, some tubes, some plastic tubes. Yeah? Or over here as well, you can also use the larger ones. Of course, they won't fit in here. Oh, well, 
not not quite yeah yeah i'm just uh just saying that uh, this is um, a possibility okay um something that i'm i'm using right now okay yeah so yeah and because it's padded on the inside it also doesn't make too much sound uh when you carry it along yeah yeah just uh, thought that uh, yeah want, wanted to share this with you okay um and back to the back to the rotifers and maybe you know what I'm just going to make another slide because I wanted to know um, what other microorganisms I find uh, in the other samples. So there is another, and I have to tell you, I've already forgot, I totally forgot what I already had in here. And uh, usually what I do, because um, I used uh, this tip here for the uh, previous sample, I do not want to cross-contaminate. Um, it's not that it's a big problem, really, but uh, I simply uh, drop it off. And I've got here a box of fresh tips and here we go okay here it is and uh, let's have a look at another sample okay so here we go yeah i'm going to take it up now this is the general rule and if you see something with the unaided eye okay then um um there's going to be enough sample here also for the microscope it looks very green so I suppose a lot of algae in here, but of course I have to take a cover glass. Okay. So, and uh, I again put it in here like this and uh, because I do not want to spill anything over. And generally, um, if you keep the amount of water low, then this also compresses the microorganisms a little bit between the cover glass and the slide, and this limits the movement, the vertical movement, and then um, it's uh, easier to focus, okay? So um, I go back to the microscope view. Uh -huh. Okay, let's take this out here. And let's put the other one in and let's have a look. I think this one should have some live microorganisms. At least a few days ago, I found a few, but uh, yeah. Uh, a nematode worm, okay. Yeah, also a decomposer. Okay, a nematode worm, let's have a closer look here. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, those nematode worms are, are very, very common <laughs> as, as well. Actually, there are two of them here. And uh, quite nice, actually, because uh, if you look into the nematode worm, difficult a little bit because it's moving so rapidly, you see that it's uh, pigmented inside. And I think uh, the reason why um, it has a color, brownish, greenish color on the inside is because of all of the stuff that it's eaten, all of the algae. So um, the, the color of the food actually also reflects uh, in the color um, of, the, um, of the organism sometimes. Yeah? I'm just wondering how long can microorganisms live in a jar from pond water? I got three small plastic containers with pond water in it. Honestly, um, I've kept them for months and months and months, provided that you do, they do not dry out. Okay, um, and uh, if you have some food in there, like like dry uh, dry grass or, or or yeah that yeah, uh, there is no reason why yeah they shouldn't be able to survive. As a matter of fact, it is possible to keep um, uh, the uh, microorganisms even living on a microscope slide, provided that the slide does not dry out. Now, what's going to happen definitely is is that there is going to be a change in microorganisms because some of them start to multiply, others then they're being eaten up again. So there is certainly a progression. And of those rotifers that you just saw a couple of minutes ago, they were not present at the beginning. Yeah, there were lots of, I don't know, ciliates present. Um, and uh, then over the weeks, um, yeah, it, uh, the, the population shifted. Over here, for example, we see a lot of um, nematode worms. Yeah, yeah, a couple of, I don't know, flagellates or ciliates, a, t a couple of tiny cells also in the background here. Yeah. Uh, but this is essentially something that is uh, nothing unusual, that uh, the, the amount of oxygen present, the temperature, the light present, has a significant impact into which direction um, um, a, a water sample develops. And I think it's also one of the fun parts or interesting parts, uh, because the same water sample will look different. Well, this guy is going crazy. Will look different, um, yeah, after some time. Yeah? 
Yeah, more biological details, please. Oh, fine. <laughs> yeah, no, you see, that's for me. Um, it's always a little bit of a, of a thing. I'm, uh, it's difficult to judge what are people interested in. Uh, I can really go off and really lecture long hours uh, over uh, interesting biological details. Um, I'm always a little bit worried that I'm losing some of uh, the audience this way. Not everyone's always interested in that. So I'm, I'm trying to get some kind of a mix between biology and, 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 <laughs> and just a pure nature observation here. Yeah. Um, I believe that bacteria also use horizontal, yes, 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 yes. B bacteria also use uh, horizontal gene transfer over so-called plasmids. And that's actually one of the worries that um, um, the people have who are doing genetic engineering. What you do is, is you make a genetically modified uh, bacterium and uh, uh, then it's able to transmit or trans, not transmit, transfer this uh, modified DNA to other bacteria. Um, and this is uh, kind of, they're kind of worried about that because then you kind of lose control over the DNA. Yeah, in nature. Yeah. Yes, uh, it is really interesting. Love the biological details. Well, good to know. Um, I just want to tell you the following. Also a little bit of an advertisement if you don't know yet. Um, this is only one of the uh, microscopy channels that I have. I do have another microscopy channel called Microbe Hunter. This one I called Microbe Hunter Microscopy. And the Microbe Hunter um, channel, the main channel, which has also um, is a little bit larger, um, I post shorter videos. But um, in recent uh, weeks, I've... Uh, been going into more into the direction of doing a little bit more of biology background. So if you're interested more in the biology background, um, I also encourage you to visit the other channel. This one over here, I just want to show you some microscopy techniques and, and, and things like this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Details. Okay. Good, good, good. Fine. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> if you're interested in this, I can do that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I'm interested in those biological details. Can you post a reference for that article explaining the horizontal change? Yeah, I'd have to check on that. But um, I think um, you might check in my other channel and Google for rot first because I made several months ago a slightly more detailed video um, on this, just on the rot and on the um, horizontal gene transfer. Yeah. We are biology teachers too. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Do they have gills? No. Okay. Um, those uh, rotifers do not have gills in the sense that fish have. Um, and um, I think it's also not needed because they're able to absorb the oxygen directly over um, the body. Yeah. The body surface. Yeah. Again here. This here. Again, a the nematode worm. Okay. Saturdays at what time? Um, always, well, Central European time at 9.30 in the evening. I do those live streams, but I usually pre-announce it a few hours in advance. So if you visit this channel, then it will actually show you already the thumbnail and uh, the time and a countdown timer until the, the live stream starts. And I generally want to keep up the schedule every Saturday at this time, unless unless um, for whatever reason I'm not able to do that. Huh? But uh, essentially I, I just want to keep up uh, doing that. Sometimes um, I don't know um, until very short time in notice on the topic. Okay. Um, sometimes I come up with the topics quite late, but I want to keep up the, yeah, the, the live stream every Saturday. I use spirulina powder and yeast to feed my infusoria. Yes, and as a matter of fact, I've got some yeast here and I also would like to feed some uh, some yeast uh, to uh, those uh, rotifers. And I'm going to go down here with the magnification again a little bit further because I would like to get a better overview of what this sample here has. Yeah, those uh, single-celled organisms here. Yeah, and, yeah, so you see that... Uh, you see the other sample had a lot of rotifers. This one over here seems to be more populated with, uh, with nematode worms. Yeah. So, but, and then I had again samples that were full with, uh, full with uh, paramecium. Yeah. So otherwise, yeah. I think the other one, the other sample was a little bit more interesting really. Okay. But I guess uh, you hope you get that. Ah, isn't this? <laughs> Look at this guy here. Uh, this seems to be the exoskeleton of a mite. A mite is, uh, yeah, isn't, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's most certainly an exoskeleton. And right next to it is the, this is of course the nematode worm. Yeah, you can see its organs. And this one over here is the, the exoskeleton. That's basically the hard outside, uh, yeah, uh, yeah um, skeleton of, of a mite. Um, they're basically, uh, some, t um, some time ago I had a, a water sample that was full and full and full of mites. And uh, yeah, 
then either they're shedding their exoskeleton or they're dying and then they're decomposing. Yeah, yeah not, not so much here again. Yeah, I might be uh, checking the other water samples because I would like to know a little bit is, um, if there is some living uh, material um, yeah, in those old water samples that uh, I've been yeah, storing here for, for quite some time. Um, I'm going to go back to the uh, questions and then I've got another water sample standing over there behind me which have been, has been in there for uh, over a year, I would say. Yeah? How many species of rotifers are there? Oh, oh my gosh, a lot. Um, I also researched this and I don't even know if they actually know the exact number, but there are a lot of them. Yeah. I have heard that hospital clothes have copper thread as an antimicrobial, possible. Some understanding of how the cilia actually function would be interesting. Um, and the sphere of influence in some of the images is up twice the body length. Yep. Uh, the, uh, the cilia is actually quite well known how they function. Uh, they have uh, so-called microtubules in them. Uh, those microtubules are um, yeah, is a, basically a very common structure that you find. These are protein fibers. I'm just going to uh, yeah, uh, illustrate this. If, if my two hands were those uh, protein fibers, if you slide them past each other, then you see that actually it's able to move. Yeah? If you a sliding motion is able to make uh, the cilia uh, also rotate and, and go in a circle. And that's because the protein fibers slide and this actually the sliding motion translates into a, yeah, into a, a moving motion of the, of the cilia. But because I'm not happy with the sample here, I'm going back again to the other one uh, with the rotifers. And uh, maybe I'm going to um, add a little bit of yeast here as well. Sometimes the rotifers um, actually, where are they now? Here, here is one. Sometimes they actually tend to move to one direction uh, where there is more oxygen. They sometimes accumulate and yeah, somewhere where there is more oxygen. Uh, here there are more. Ah, yeah, here they are. Okay, too small. So let's go up again. Here are a few more. Okay, what is this? Ah, uh, this seems. To, what is this here? Ah, uh, this seems to be. Is this some kind of a string or some kind of a edge of the water? Could be. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, is that why we use copper pipes for water? This could be the case, uh, but I would say probably the copper pipes uh, could could also be a practical reason. Yeah. Uh, this, um, what I heard is is that that's one of the reasons why coins are also made out of copper and not some other material because the metal itself is also um, actually limiting the growth of of, of bacteria. Yeah. But this is actually quite, uh, quite well known that metals actually are able to inhibit uh, certain enzymes. It's also, for example, one of the reasons why certain metals in batteries like cadmium and so on uh, are actually quite bad for water organisms uh, because, uh, because uh, those metals, they uh, will start to oxidize and then uh, the, the ionic form of those metals is somehow able to bind to certain enzymes in the cells and in inhibit them and that actually kills them off. Yeah. Um, micro, they seem to have a shell. Do you know what it's made of? You mean what shell? Uh, if you talk about the mites, then they have this, the exoskeleton is made of chitin. Chitin, like insects and, and, um, and arachnids, which are basically the spiders to which the mites belong, they have an exoskeleton made of the substance chitin. Um, yeah, do they have a nervous system? How would the cells? Uh, I, I, I probably would say, um, yeah, that uh, rotifers being micro animals have a simple nervous system and they need to have that because they are making a coordinated body movement. But um, whether they actually have a, a, a something called cephalization, you call it in biology, this is basically the formation of a brain. I kind of doubt that. Um, very simple organisms, um, sometimes they have ganglia, which are an accumulation of nerve cells. But that's not a full brain yet. Okay. Would an eye be better visible in bright field? Possibly I can try that. But this must be a dark spot somewhere. And I don't think that I've actually seen one. Yeah. Um, and normally uh, when you see the uh, organisms that have eyes, like for example, Daphnia and, and Copepods, and the eye is really well visible as a dark or, or red spot. Yeah. Um, and uh, over here, I've not seen them so much. Yeah. Have you ever done a video on the effects of uh, colloidal silver on microbes? No, not yet. Um, 
However, it is, I know that colloidal sil uh, silver, um, uh, silver staining, however, is also used. Uh, this basically means that uh, paramecia, for example, you can actually distinguish them by the way that they're uh, reacting to silver staining. Um, but that is also something that it's uh, quite nice to see. Um, yeah, I'm quite sure that uh, silver or other metals will most certainly um, be harmful for microorganisms because, um, yeah, as we talk, talked about this, metals are generally poisonous. Yeah? You can see those red spots better in dark field. Okay, okay, interesting. Geoducts are very large clams. Ah, okay. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Are these intelligent? How do they find their way? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good question. I, I like this. And the reason why I like this question is I made uh, recently a video about this, about intelligence, microbial intelligence. And um, uh, I'm going to be very honest with you. Um, of course, you can say it depends a little bit on how you define intelligence. But uh, no, uh, organisms like this uh, do not have an intelligence uh, that uh, generally we... Uh, yeah, we as humans would consider intelligence simply because they respond to the environment does not mean that they are intelligent in the way that we consider it intelligence, like the ability to learn or so on. Yeah, um, so um, they don't have a brain that would be able to do that, and yeah, but they are able to respond to the environment. Yeah. Um, like all living things do, uh, like plants also respond uh, to light. For example, the, the plant grows towards light, the roots grow towards water and towards the ground. Uh, but we would not consider a plant intelligent because it does that. So you see, it's a little bit philosophical also because the uh, question is, is um, what uh, is even, does even intelligence mean? Yeah? Do rotifers live in saltwater or freshwater? They live in both. Uh, some of them uh, are, um, yeah, I've uh, heard that they live in both, but, uh, but these are all freshwater rotifers. Yeah? Love your live streams. Have you tried moving cells on the slide? I heard eyebrows and here is a good tool. What you do is the following. Um, this, in the, especially in the 19th century, this has been done uh, quite a bit. Is uh, they used to move? Uh, they took an eyebrow or an eyelash, and the, yeah, if you put an eyebrow or eyelash under the microscope, then you see that the the, the end is very pointed, and then they glued it um, on a little stick so that you have a handle, and then uh, they were actually under the microscope able to manipulate and move diatoms around. Diatoms are very beautiful. They have a very beautiful shell and they were able, able to arrange them in very nice patterns to make permanent mounts. I have not, not tried this. It, it takes a very steady hand. These days you would probably use a so-called micro manipulator. Um, th these are devices that are used in science. They're like a, have some, some, some like a joystick where you can actually manipulate individual cells under the microscope. Kind of expensive. I've been actually planning to 3D print uh, maybe one myself, uh, but this is highly experimental. But it, yes, it is possible to manipulate individual cells under the microscope. Yeah? I'm using the plastic boxes from a Chinese takeaway, yes, <laughs> uh, as, a, as a toolbox. Can you use polarized light on these microbes? Uh, yes, you can. And as a matter of fact, uh, what I'm using here is polarized light. Uh, the, yeah, that's why it's also uh, looking blue in the background here. How do you clean your material like pipettes and microscope slides? Ah, yes, I just did a little bit of cleaning today. Um, what I, I do is the following. Um, I collect, you know what, I quickly switch back a little bit here. Um, I switch back uh, you, you have to here, to the desk view. Uh, I collect the slides in a box like this. And then after a couple of days, the water evaporates and it dries. And then what I do is, is I pour boiling hot water over it to kill everything off again. Uh, and this also dissolves a little bit the material. And then I simply use soap, just regular plain soap and running water. And what I do is the following. Yeah, I just uh, take soap water and I simply uh, use my fingers and uh, try to rub any um, residue off and then, then I rinse it. Um, you've got to rinse it properly. You don't want to have any soap on here because it might harm the microorganisms. And then you use some tissue paper to dry it. Otherwise, I'm going to get water spots. That's it. Okay, um, so I yes, I do recycle um, the, the slides. I do not recycle any slides that could possibly contain infectious material um, like, I don't know, yeah, or disgusting stuff. I'm, I'm not going to, yeah, just throw it away, yeah. Okay, what are the main parts of a rotifer? Oh, that's also an interesting one. Uh, you got the foot and you got the body and you got the head. 
Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, um, some people, are by, by looking at the, the and honestly, there are not so many different types of rotifers in here. Seems to be one dominant species. What in the world? Look at this. Silly. Look, that's an interesting one. Look at this guy here. Another one. That is a single celled. Um, and what fascinates me is, is look at this here. Okay. The single celled ciliate. And just compare the size. Oh, no, it's gone. This, the size of one of those single cell ciliates with, let's say, a rotifer which might contain a thousand cells. The size difference is not that large, right? But it kind of shows you also a little bit the diversity of the the diversity of um, of cell size. Yeah? Uh, off topic, but would you be able to see what blood type you are under the microscope? Uh, definitely no. You're not able to see the blood type under the microscope because the blood type is determined by surface proteins on the red blood cells, the so-called the surface antigens, and they are way too small to be seen with a microscope. Okay, So you have to do a chemical test or an immunological test to determine the blood type, but it is not possible to see it because the things that determine the blood type um, are proteins, surface proteins, uh, uh, which are way too small to be seen. We're way below the resolution limit. Yeah? So that's unfortunately not possible. Uh, have you ever tried to slowly increase the amount of salt in a water sample to see which creatures are able to adapt? Um, what you can... No, I have not tried it. Um, but this would be a long-term experiment. Um, what you have, what you could do is the follow... Uh, this is uh, probably one that takes maybe months. Um, what you can try to do is you take a water sample and you add a little bit of salt. And uh, you may, uh, then this basically means that those organisms that are not able to survive it are going to die off. And those that are able to survive the salt are continue to reproduce. And then you increase the salt level. Um, so basically... Um, We've, uh, when I was at university, I've, we've done a similar experiment, but not with salt, but we slowly increased the concentration of uh, other substances like antibiotics or so um, to illustrate that this way you're actually able to yeah, make antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, what I read, however, that's, uh, which goes into that direction is, is that uh, pretty much all of us or many of us have dishwashers um, at home, right? Those ma dishwashing machines where you put the plates uh, into it and then you uh, basically it washes dishes. And apparently scientists found out that in those dishwashers there are now bacteria growing that are able to withstand an extremely high temperature. So uh, what the dishwashing machine has done is it's basically selected bacteria um, that are able to survive those temperatures and they cannot be killed off as easily anymore by boiling hot water. And uh, it's a little bit the suggestion here, if I were to increase the salt concentration slowly over a long time, I'm, I'm, of course, most certainly I'm going to then have uh, organisms present that are able to survive higher salt concentrations yeah? because they're going to adapt. So it is not uh, something which is uh, totally um, unusual because we can actually observe this. Yeah, yeah. nematodes on drugs. <laughs> yes, uh, it's possible to add different substances here. Okay. Do you know, ah, most exciting podcast. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do you know what rotifers eat? Algae decomposing stuff. Yes, um, I found rotifers um, a lot in um, samples that cont uh, contain decomposing material. Like for example, um, in this case here, um, the, 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 a, a jar of, of, of uh, decomposing grass. Yeah? Um, wh when you make uh, this yourself, um, don't use tap water because tap water does not contain those rotifers. Yeah, you, and the rotifers, they don't grow on dry grass. So you have to actually add a, a water sample that does contain um, those microorganisms that you want to enrich. Yeah. Uh, why do nematodes love vinegar? Remember you did a video. Yes, one specific, I'm, not, I'm not saying that they generally love vinegar. Okay. But I've got over here, um, oh, they're called vinegar eels. Right, it's full, and if you look at it, it's almost like a cloud here. Um, yeah, there are millions, I don't know, millions, maybe not, but maybe several, I don't know, maybe several hundred thousands of, of nematode worms. And those nematodes, they like, those specific ones, they like uh, vinegar. Uh, but I would not uh, say that all of them like. The nematodes are an incredibly diverse uh, um, group of, of, uh, of animals. Um, and uh, yeah, it depends really which, uh, which uh, one you're looking at. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so hello from Kentucky, United States. Yeah. 
How, uh, are these collapse inside of the mind? Oh, that refers to the other one. I don't know. Uh, I don't know now. Could be. Yeah. Uh, are they attracted or avoid light? That is also something that one could try out. And um, I don't know about that. And uh, uh, generally, there is. <laughs> I'm going to tell you now a little, a little uh, um, anecdote. Um, I'm. I'm uh, very often, um, because I teach biology, high school um, biology as well, and and, and so on, uh, I'm getting very often questions uh, um, by still interested questions like this. I mean, are they attracted to light, or do they avoid light, or what do they eat? Do they eat algae? Do they prefer bacteria? And uh, of course, sometimes I don't know the answer, but I always am able to give a an answer that uh, yeah that is correct. And I will tell you that the answer now is. is Chances are that um, if you look hard enough in nature, you're going to find something that does that. So in other words, if you're saying, can it be that rotifers are attracted to light and I don't know it, then I'm going to say, if you look hard enough in nature, I'm quite certain that you're able to find rotifers that are attracted by light. Okay, um, Or if you ask, well, I don't know, are they able to survive high salt concentrations? Uh, then my answer is always, well, if you look hard enough in nature, nature biodiversity is so large, chances are pretty good that you're going to find somewhere um, uh, some of those that are able to survive high salt concentrations. Are they able to, I don't know, survive high temperatures? Well, I'm quite sure if you look hard enough, you get the idea. Yeah? Um, usually this answer is correct um, because nature is extremely diverse. And um, generally, that's also something that I would like to share with you a little bit. Uh, it's also something that uh, one of my university professors told us uh, many uh, students many years ago is um, generally, if you just use your biological common sense, that's what they told us. And if you think that something might be possible because it um, then most likely somewhere in nature, it's going to be found. OK. Um, you're not, it's not allowed to violate any physical laws or laws of nature. Um, you cannot say, am I able to find a living thing that is not made of cells? That, that's not going to happen, okay? Because that would violate a very basic biological law that all living things are made of cells, right? But um, if you uh, ask in a more, um, uh, more less basic questions, are you able to find rotifers that eat other rotifers? More, yeah, chances are pretty good. That you're able to find those, right? Um, so I don't know. They're cannibalizing, right? Why not? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think you even read somewhere that some of them actually do that. Yeah. Um, so that's basically the the basic the the recommendation that I can give. Um, that um, chances are pretty good. Everything's there out there. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so uh, more questions. I wouldn't like to be a nematode worm. Looks like hard work. <laughs> I'm always a little bit surprised where they're actually getting their energy from. Yeah. Uh, del deloid rotifers, yes, some of them are. Copper is very malleable, which means it can bend. Also, lead is, uh, and this is why it's used for water pipes. Yes, that's uh, basically an explanation of why copper was used. Yeah? Um, I meant that the rotifers seem to have a shell, something they are able to attract like a snail. Uh, it's not really a shell, but I can imagine that would be also interesting. Maybe, maybe they also have something like a soft exoskeleton that is made of chitin. Okay. So, yes, again, are rotifers single-celled organisms? No, they're not single-celled. Um, they are multi-celled. That's why they're called micro-animals. And they're actually one of the smaller, um, smaller animals out there. And uh, basically, yeah, um, they are actually made of uh, multiple cells. But the number of cells is, uh, within a species seems to be uh, constant. Okay. Um, one of Latin America's largest theme parks has uh, replaced its most frequently touched surfaces with copper to help uh, reduce the spread of germs. Yes, that's that's quite uh, not yeah quite quite plausible. Yeah, um, fixed number of cells called an uh, nectic organism. Okay, uh, like a tardigrade. Yes, tardigrades also have that. I wonder if they are able to communicate with each other. Um, honestly. Um, by releasing certain chemical substances, it's very widespread in nature um, that uh, organisms uh, are able to communicate with each other over the spread of chemical substances. So I would be, same answer as before, um, I guess, uh, if you look hard enough, uh, then uh, you're probably going to find some chemical substances that those rotifers are able to use. Yeah? Um, I mean, in the case of sexual reproduction, um, 
I mean, they don't like, to, some of them reproduce sexually, majority not, but in the case of sexual reproduction, chemical pheromones, pheromones are definitely, um, are used uh, for communication. Yeah? So, how do you make the blue background like this? How do I make a red background like this? <laughs> yeah, or any other color, greenish one, I don't know. Yeah, um, because I have uh, basically specialized optics that do that. Um, it's called DIC optics. Um, however, if you want to have a similar effect, then I highly recommend that you make yourself some filters. I made videos on this, uh, but here, I mean, something like this. And then what you have is, is you have a, a light coming from one side, yeah, which uh, causes the organism to be bright in the background is blue. So you can play around with those so-called Reinberg filters um, um, as, as well. Yeah. Uh, which gives it a nice color. The reason why I am um, using those colors is because I'm doing a lot of live streams and videos and it's simply yeah, um, easier to see because uh, YouTube also, sometimes the image quality is a little bit lower and uh, therefore it, it's uh, a little bit of color is, is always nice. Yeah. The silly is maybe a stenter. I don't think that this one, the one that we saw before was a stenter. Okay, I don't think so. Yeah. They have a very common genus. What is the lifespan of a rotifer? How many eggs can they produce? Oh my gosh, these are interesting questions. Honestly, um, I don't know what the lifespan of a rotifer is. Um, yeah, I don't even know if, if some of them have a limited lifespan. Well, no, they are not. Yeah, I don't know to what, to what extent they're able to regenerate certain animals. Like for example, Hydra, you can almost say that they have an almost, almost unlimited lifespan because they're always able to grow a new offspring of the main body. Yeah? Um, so do they have a nervous system? How would the cells communicate without nerves? Some kind of form? Yes, uh, that is nothing unusual. Uh, cells uh, communicating or, uh, um, with each other over, over chemicals. As a matter of fact, they do that. Uh, for example, there are certain um, so-called slime molds. These are actually individual cells which uh, then communicate over chemicals and which aggregate and come together um, to form something almost like an organism. And uh, these are actually individual cells that are able to, to come together over chemical signaling. Yeah. Um, okay, could you control water evaporation which would increase the salt concentration? Um, yeah, that would be a possibility. So basically you add a certain amount of salt uh, to a water sample and then let it evaporate slowly. And as it evaporates, the salt concentration goes up. I think that is how it's possible. Yeah. Uh, so rotifer eggs just are transported by wind or by which, okay. So I think this is an interesting question as well. Um, so the question is the following. Let's say that you have somewhere um, a, I don't know, a, a newly constructed water fountain some, yeah, or, a, or maybe um, a pond that was created. And the question is now, um, how is it possible that after a couple of weeks or months, all of a sudden you see um, all different forms of microorganisms in there? They cannot appear out of their own. Yeah? So they need to come from somewhere. So the question is now, is how is it possible that in a newly created water fountain yeah, somewhere, uh, that all of a sudden there are algae there, there are rotifers there, where do they come from? And they, yes, they must have been transported either by wind or by other animals. Yeah? Um, basically, it must have been transferred. And then this water fountain itself, again, has a highly um, unique, uh, specific conditions. And this basically should therefore not surprise us that the rotifers or whatever microorganisms live or grow in there are then different after some time from those in other places because they will adapt to the local environment over uh, several generations. Yeah? Um, especially so as, uh, if they're isolated from the rest and they will actually uh, develop and, uh, and evolve in, in a certain direction. Yeah? Um, but they must actually indeed uh, be carried there by wind, uh, weather, um, other animals, maybe birds um, and so on. Yeah? Otherwise they're not able to spread. Yeah? Have you tried all types of viewing methods, filters, polarization, curler, the best results? Is this the best? Um, I will be honest with you. Um, <laughs> and I know that this sounds like a, a, a little bit like a, a non-satisfactory answer, but the best technique, it really depends a lot on what you want to observe. I will give you an example. If you want to observe staining, okay, then using this method is not good because this method already adds color to it. 
um, but if I want to stain something, I have to actually use um, yeah, a, an imaging technique that does not add color to it so that I can see the stain better right? Um, you see what I mean? It depends really um, a lot. I'm going to show you now something else, okay? Um, simply to illustrate this, this here is now 40 times, okay? And in bright field, just for comparison here. Now 40 times um, yeah, in DIC, okay? And now I'm going to show you the same thing 40 times in phase contrast, okay? So I'm going to switch over, I have one phase contrast objective of 40 times. I have to now change the filter. I have to open it. And this is now phase contrast. Okay. Um, now you can see this doesn't look very interesting. I think the other one looked actually quite nicer. Um, and indeed, phase contrast is not very suitable for looking at thicker specimens. But what phase contrast is really good at is, is making bacteria visible. And all of those tiny or very small ones and those tiny dots here, many of them actually could be bacteria. And they can be seen as dark dots on a bright background. Now, there are not so many bacteria here in this sample because uh, the rotifers kind of cleaned everything away, right? Um, but yeah transparent objects are much better visible this way. Yeah? But only if those objects are re reasonably thin. Um, but I do not think that this rotifer over here or these here, that, I don't know, they don't look very, very good in phase contrast. And this is also well known that uh, uh, thicker objects in phase contrast, they don't really produce the, quite the, the result that you might w uh, wish for, right? Um, so this is uh, simply something that I can uh, say that um, there is no single best, um, there is no single best, uh, yeah, best way. Yeah? Um, and uh, yeah, so, so let's let's move on. Wow, there there are more and more questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go through those comments very quickly. I read everything, but I might not comment on everything. Okay, uh, looking at an invertebrate textbook, they have a small blob brain. Okay, but yeah, but gl ganglia, which are exactly so. Basically, it's about the nervous system of, of those rotifers. They have ganglia, which are collections of, of of nerve cells. Yeah, some do seem to have an eye intracellular lens with pigment cup. Interesting. Thank you for this uh, inf information. So we've, uh, yeah, Christopher now uh, got some information from a textbook that actually they might even have something like an eye here. Okay. I live in a desert. Um, are there any places specific to deserts that would be interesting to find microbes compared to forested areas or such? Or are the types of microbes very similar from place to place? No. Um, Let's put it this way, bacteria you find everywhere, right? Uh, chances are pretty good that if you have somewhere, um, um, uh, um, a place where there's standing water for several days or several weeks, and even there will be uh, several microorganisms uh, growing there. If you're in a desert, if I were in a desert, what I would probably do is I would actually really observe a lot of, uh, um, of, uh, of sand. I know of a, um, yeah, a friend of mine who's uh, been, uh, who's a zoologist and he wrote his um, thesis um, um, in uh, basically analyzing the so-called foraminifera in sand samples. Foraminifera are shells of uh, um, uh, um, uh, of certain amoeba, amoeba tests, uh, um, yeah, and and so on. And uh, they can be found in sand samples, and that was was he, it was the thing that he was actually studying. So he actually got uh, sand samples from all over the world, and he was studying those. Right. So uh, there are even um, in specific locations where there is no water, there are plenty of things uh, to uh, to specialize on and, and to find. Yeah. The ciliate looks like a small okay loxophyllum. I think it's uh, too small though. Um, I found a rotifer in a bird bath that was filled with tap water after a few days. Yes, because um, yeah, if there is organic material there that they're able to decompose, yeah, then they're going to reproduce there. Are you sharing live video on YouTube only or are you other platforms right now because I don't see the comments you read? No, um, actually uh, I'm sharing it on YouTube and actually everyone should be able to see the comments that I read. The comments should be on the, on the side of the video and uh, I hope actually that this uh, can be seen. No, I'm not, I'm only sharing it on YouTube, okay? Um, okay, I think that um, uh, the mouth of the rotifer is called the trophy. I, I thought it was actually called the mastax, the mouth of the rotifer, okay? The body of rotifers have a body wall made of, uh, of a cuticle epidermis and 
sub subterminal muscles. I'm reading from In the Vertebrate Biology by Paul Megalich, 1967. Old but detailed. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so they have uh, the outside of the uh, rotifer is called the the cuticle. By the way, what you see over here, this is arrow. <laughs> this, of course, is an ear bubble. Okay, and uh, these are some the rotifers which are still in in the water. And you know what? Just for the fun of it, um, I'm going to yeah feed them a little bit of of uh, yeast. Okay, um, yeah. So what I'm doing right now is I'm simply going to take a new tip and uh, let's add a little bit of yeast suspension to those uh, rotifers and uh, not necessarily because I just want them to feed them, but because the yeast cells actually make the water movement quite well visible, okay? So let's have a look. You see that the air bubble is actually, uh, yeah, the water is evaporating and kind of the air bubble is expanding and expanding. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move this here a little bit over, okay? And uh, usually at the side here, I'm adding a little bit of, uh, yeah, Wow, look at the water stream, ha, look at this, <laughs> look at the yeast cells. Yeah, immediately uh, it started to be sucked in uh, by capillary action and all of these things here are now yeast cells. The rotifers first, they started to retract a little bit by the water stream, yeah. And now let's see what they're doing now. Okay. What, what are they doing? Yeah, maybe they, they should actually start to to move the um, yeah the water around them again. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I've seen actually more active rotifers a few days ago. They don't seem to like it very much. Why is that? <laughs> I mean, the sample is already uh, a couple of days old. So I don't know, could it be that, could it be that the yeast started to ferment and started to produce alcohol that they don't like it? Well, it's kind of strange. You know what, I'm, I might re try it again using a fresh yeast uh, sample, but those rotifers, they started to, yeah, kind of pull together a little bit here. Let's go down a little bit with the magnification. That's a little bit disappointing. I was actually hoping that they kind of liked the food, but they didn't like the food. That's an interesting... Look! None of them liked the food. Why is that? Hmm. Did I just kill them with my yeast suspension? That's an interesting thing. <laughs> no, really, they really didn't like it. You know what? Um, because I had it in there already a few days, uh, maybe indeed uh, the yeast started to ferment and, and produce some alcohol and maybe this actually killed, killed it a little bit. Which is a, somewhat of a surprise, um, but you know what? Um, in this case, um, I do not consider this to be a, a failed experiment because what I'm going to do now simply is I'm going to make a fresh yeast suspension because I'm... Yeah, let's put this away and uh, I'm going to do the following. By the way, that's another thing I wanted to show you because I do not have running water here where I am. Yeah, I bought myself some of those uh, yeah, water kind of uh, bottles and then you can use uh, this here to yeah, put some water in here. Okay, and where is my yeast? So I'm using some dry yeast. And uh, let's add a little bit of dry yeast to... Ah! Whoa, this was way too much. See, not a good thing, um, doesn't matter. I'm going to simply take out uh, some of the dissolved yeast later. Yeah, um, who, ah, I'm just gonna leave it right now. The yeast, the dissolved yeast will collect on the bottom and uh, it's gonna be fine. And I'm just going to make another sample. Okay, so um, here, this was my rotifer uh, suspension. And I'm just going to use again a little bit of some of the decomposed material from the bottom of the jar. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a lot or not. You know what, um, just to make sure that I really have uh, caught something here. Where did I put my... Yeah, here. Here it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take out a small sample of, of the decomposing grass here. and. 
get more of the stuff off. Okay. And uh, let's have a look. Now again, again a cover glass. Because the yeast um, is very nice uh, to see because then you can see the movement much, much better um, of uh, the streaming water. And let's have a look here. So let's find a few of them uh, here. Here are a few again. Here we go. The slide is a little bit dirty. I'm just uh, just realized. So, okay, uh, now let's uh, repeat the same experiment again. Um, look, uh, let's go back here. Let's add a little bit more water here. Because this is a really dense yeast suspension. Yeah, some of the yeast might not be fully dissolved yet. So there might be a lot of clumps present. And uh, back to the microscope view. And let's feed them again to the edge of the cover glass. It could of course be that there's a little too much water now uh, in here. And uh, if there is too much water on, on one side, then what you do is, is you simply take some tissue paper and you remove the water on the other side. You see how um, yeah, the water is now soaked through. Here are the yeast cells somewhere. Where are they? Uh, way too dense. Okay. Mm. Yep, the yeast cells are not sucked through. Um, I'm going to take the, I'm gonna do the following. I'm gonna take it off and I'm gonna, of course not because it didn't touch the cover glass. Can you believe it? Oh, <laughs> oh gosh, this, this was a, that's a little bit embarrassing. This is where the cover glass is. I, I didn't, uh, I got it, it's far too far away from, from, from the place. I, I could not see the edge of the cover glass and therefore this is really the wrong place. So let's try it again. Okay, here we go. Okay, refocus. Where is it? Okay, here are the yeast cells now being yeah, sucked in beneath the cover glass. A lot of them, way too many of them. Okay. Now we have to wait a little bit, a few minutes uh, for the um, water to completely spread. But you see now that the rotifers, they, uh, yeah, they don't roll up. And uh, the idea is, is to see how uh, the stream water movement created by the cilia of the rotifers heads. Okay. Let's have a look here. Let's find one. I don't know. Ah, this this round thing looks a little bit is similar to a vorticella or something. I don't know. So where are they? Here, here's one. No, that's not a rotifer. That's a that's a paramecium. <laughs> okay, that's a paramecium. Okay, uh, it's also going to be happy that it got some food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you can see now, yeah, let's stay with the paramecium here a little bit. You can see now that, uh, yeah, how the paramecium is now moving the water around it by, see, ah, down here, there's a, here's a rotifer, yeah. So now we see the movement much better. Uh, it's the rotifer is now right at the edge of the air bubble. So I go down with the magnification a little bit so that we get a better overview. Oh uh, yeah. Here, here are a few, right next to the air bubble. Maybe. 
Let me find them. Okay, let's just stick with those two here. Yep, so you see that apparently this yeast uh, suspension did not hurt uh, them so much. And I, indeed, I think that this might be due to the age of the yeast suspension that I used. So maybe indeed it started to ferment, produce some alcohol. Uh, and uh, then maybe this is the reason why it killed off uh, those uh, rotifers. But here, uh, they, they seem to be just fine. Huh? Okay, uh -huh. I believe DSC is mostly pleasing uh, between 300 days. Google say, okay, the Rotifer's lifespan, a few days, apparently, according to Google. Okay, very good. Uh, have you found or looked at into Hydra? I found some Hydra, indeed, um, in a pond. Uh, very nice, uh, very nice water organisms. Uh, are any of today's viewing techniques considered dark field? Mm, um, not yet. Okay. Um, it is possible. So the question is, is um, did I use dark field today? No, I did not. But what I can do is, is I can show you how dark field would look like. Okay. I have to put in the face. If I, if I put in the face, um, let me see. Where is this? If I put in the face contrast, um, see, this would be dark field. Uh, with four times and that's the only one way that I can get it. Okay. Um, I'm now using the phase contrast uh, uh, Filter and the phase contrast filter with the lowest power objective is able to produce a dark field image But all of those white things that you see in the background. That's the yeast. Okay, so you see that everything is 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 now um, Yeah full of yeast yeah? So yeah, but that would be dark field So here you can see the individual rotifers again here. It is a little bit less yeast here. Ah, here all of them are. They're all collected here on the side. Yeah. So that is a little bit the thing that I just want. So yeah, that's that's dark field now. Yeah, and if I go up with uh, the objective, then I'm losing the dark field effect. Yeah. And here we are again with DIC. Yeah. So again, here we, what we have on the side this we have uh, over here, yeah, paramecium and a rotifer. And I think very nice, the paramecium here is, is a single cell and the rotifer is a multicellular. And you see that the size is actually quite similar. That's also one of the things that's kind of fascinates me, uh, the, yeah, the, the similarity in, in, in the similarity in, in, in size, but the fact that one of them is actually one cell and uh, uh, and the rotifer is considered to be a multi or is a multicellular animal yeah? so which would you get in a 20 times objective or 60 times objective for looking at micro animals um, for looking at micro animals uh, like this here um, depend on the size um, i generally consider a 20 times objective quite nice uh, for, for microscopic observation because it uh, because uh, many of the microscopic animals and many um, are fairly large so the 20 times I think is is quite nice to get a, a good overview um, the nice thing about 60 times of course is that you can look more into the organism but 60 times has a disadvantage many of the water microorganisms move around right and if you go up with the magnification a lot then you're losing uh, the f uh, you're losing them out of the field of view much more easily yeah. So for that sense, it, I would say the 60 times is good for water microorganisms that don't move so much or you kind of compress them a little bit yeah, between the cover glass and the microscope slide and, and then you can really zoom in much more. Yeah. And uh, otherwise for observing moving organisms, I think the 20 times is better because um, they don't move out of the field of view so easily. Yeah. Yeah. There are photos of the eyes. Okay, interesting. Water found in uh, from in a pitcher plant might yield some interesting species. Yes, okay. Can you do a video about diatoms and how to mount them? Okay, thank you for the recommendation. I, I can try to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, some time ago, I even tried to uh, prepare diatom shells out of live diatoms. You have to use some, uh, yeah, some aggressive chemicals to remove all of the organic substances um, of the diatom, but then you can get nice diatom shells, okay? Uh, 
was ein Rädertierchen nicht kennt, das filtert es nicht. <lacht> ja, that's a little bit based on a, on an, uh, yeah, on a pun. Yeah. What does the sentence mean? <lacht> There is a, is a there's a German idiomatic expression uh, that basically says that uh, yeah a, a person who doesn't yeah uh, something that a person doesn't know he, he doesn't eat yeah and this was kind of not transferred to uh, uh, to one of those rotifers yeah so basically rotifers only like to eat those things that they know what it is yeah okay uh, it's an Austrian proverb meaning that you, uh, they won't eat what they don't know yes that's correct. <laughs> yeah. um, Basically, it's not only referring this proverb does not only refer to things that uh, yeah to food, but generally things that people don't know. They don't sometimes don't like to associate themselves with. Yeah, um, for swimming pools as a filter medium and food grade diatoms used for animals against parasite would be interesting. Yes. Okay. Okay. I quickly go through is uh, yeah. Here, the mastax is a muscular chamber for digesting and biting and separating the food. Okay, but do rotifers have a single foot? Well, some rotifers um, have. Um, it depends a little bit of how you refer to it as a foot. Uh, some rotifers have um, um, basically toes, uh, so to say, um, which are the attachment sites. And depending on how they look like, you can distinguish different species of rotifers. Yeah. So um, right now you don't see it quite. Yeah, a little bit. If you look at the very end, yeah, here you see that there are actually two attachment sites. Yeah, and the number of attachment sites that a rot rotifer ha has apparently also helps um, biologists to identify them. Here you see that it's kind of forked into two. Yeah, um, and uh, basically this is uh, you know, the place where it connects now to the microscope slide. Um, have you ever considered to teach at a university instead of a high school and work on an electron microscope? It would be very interesting to see electron microscope videos. Yes, uh, that would be also, uh, um, well, I've not worked, uh, let's put it this way, while I was studied, uh, studying at university, I did have uh, the possibility to work on an electron microscope, but you had to pass a course first and it, the access to the electron microscope was very, very limited um, and restricted. So generally what they did is they did not like to allow students uh, to actually directly use the electron microscope but they actually had specially trained professionals who were doing the pictures and the microscopy for you so you basically you gave them the material that they should take a picture of um, because uh, it was highly specialized and uh, yeah um, so essentially the universities at that time if I, I think I was told is they did not just buy the microscope or the equipment but they actually bought the the technical specialist with the microscope yeah? so that you actually had a trained person to actually use the device. Yeah? Um, so in that sense, uh, unfortunately, um, yeah, those uh, electron microscopes were not um, easily accessible to us students. What can I do for it not to form so much bubbles when I put a cover glass in? Um, generally, um, the question is, is when you put a cover glass um, and the bubble formation, um, some bubbles are okay. Um, I would say that some bubbles maybe are even good because they uh, provide oxygen to the uh, to the micro, uh, to those animals. But generally, if you want to uh, put a cover glass on a microscope slide, what I recommend is is the following. I just uh, use this one over here. Um, you do the following. You put the water in here and you kind of uh, put it at an angle. It's difficult to see now. And then you lower it down. And uh, by lowering it down. At an angle, uh, you're also pushing out the air, and then the chance of uh, bubbles forming is less. But unless there are, yeah, uh, honestly, um, I personally don't mind a few air bubbles. Yeah, then you just have to find a place uh, where there are no air bubbles, and then it's going to be fine. Yeah? I even saw a rotifer dragged by a tidal wave. Yeah, how do you clean your microscope slides? Uh, by simply um, rinsing them in hot water and soap, um, and I also tried to dishwash them. Also works. Okay. Uh, put the glove glass on slowly. Yes. Okay. Uh, I quickly go through the uh, slides here. Um, it is possible to yeah get the uh, C. Uh, that's a lot of. I also used a video on how to make a dark field filter. I quickly go through here. Okay. Um, uh, what some people have done um, that I was in contact with over email is, is that they actually bought themselves a DIC uh, microscope um, secondhand. That's uh, actually uh, quite well possible as well. Yeah. 
Um, I think, I personally think that if you want to have a similar DIC effect, do the following, use oblique illumination. Sometimes you cannot see a difference. I'm, I'm serious about this. Oblique illumination is, is when light is coming from one side. All you need is, is you need a filter like this. I made separate videos. Um, and um, Or you should put in a dark field filter and uh, do it off center. You also will get a three dimensional view. Um, and uh, the effect is, uh, yeah, in some cases, not distinguishable from DIC. Okay, it, so the effect is, is very good and it costs nothing. So um, your oblique illumination is highly recommended for, yeah, for amateur use. Yeah? Um, if you put an animal like a little spider on an ant on a Ziploc bag and suck the air out of it, you can immobilize it for bits to observe it and not hurt them. Ah, yes. <laughs> what you can also do is, is uh, you yeah, not only take the air out so that, uh, it, yeah, uh, but you can also try to put them into the freezer for a couple of minutes. Uh, and when they, they cool down, then insects um, will also stop moving and you can also observe them much better until they again uh, reach room temperature. Yeah? Um, I'm aware how DSC is constructed. I was more wondering how one could go about getting it for personal use without, uh, well, um, I, uh, yeah, there are some people who basically, um, and you have, it takes time, you can actually uh, uh, do the following, you can uh, try to get something secondhand. Yeah? So that was the only thing. But then again, I probably would say it's not necessary. Yeah? Um, I have to use DIC here because otherwise the image contrast is not going to be high enough because sometimes the YouTube compression algorithm reduces the image quality and, and, and for this reason in order to see the things better I need high contrast. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I know that some people have actually bought, uh, yeah, used DSC equipment. Yeah. I'm using oblique illumination right now. I think it will continue with that until a distant relative. No, okay. Uh, this might be weird, but my fish pond does not have sediment. It is only rocks, cement, and fish, no plants. How can I make a slide from there? Um, ch chances are pretty good that there is sediment there. Turn a few rocks around or carefully try to remove some of the biofilm from a rock. Or another suggestion is, is take a jar. Yeah, take a jar like this, uh, fill in some gravel. Okay, some, some tiny rocks uh, because that's a lot of surface area and put it in there. And what's going to happen is that over time a biofilm will form. Generally, um, pretty much any pond will form sooner or later some sediment as um, plants and animals decompose and settle down in the ground. Yeah? It's a question of time. Um, it's definitely going to happen. Or um, what you can try to do is, is uh, you can try to take some, I don't know, um, some pieces of wood that you have and mix it with pond water and, and put it into a jar and then wait. Um, I've also done this. I've uh, found, collected some, some tree bark uh, with some lichens on it and so on, put it into water. And uh, this basically also gave it enough uh, moisture for also for tardigrades uh, to grow. Yeah? So um, there were really a lot of uh, yeah, microorganisms to be found. I bought my first microscope last year. Every time I use it, I notice it getting more dirty. I looked up on how to clean objective lens and found no solution. What do you recommend to clean a microscope? Um, simple answer, there is no reason for your objective lens to become dirty unless you dip the front part of the objective lens into some water or into immersion oil. Um, so, however, um, so what will happen is, is that the eyepieces might become dirty because of your eyelashes, which are greasy. And then when you always are looking into the um, object uh, eyepieces, then and you're kind of touch the eyelashes, touch the front lens. Then over time, this is going to become greasy. And what you do is, is you take those um, Q-tips, which are the, the, the cotton buds for, for cleaning your ears. And you can take some alcohol, um, not too much, and you can carefully wipe off the grease this way. Or a very useful thing for cleaning the microscope is this here. Okay, this is uh, removes dust, not needed to clean the objective, but uh, dust will always accumulate. Yeah, so I don't know, you can simply brush off uh, the dust Yeah, uh, that might accumulate. So uh, yeah, it's something that I'm doing on a more or less regular basis. Okay. Um, it sounds odd. I have you tried wiping off the eyepieces. Okay. Spin the eyepieces around and see if the dirty stuff. Yes, that's actually, by the way, an important thing. Sometimes you see something dirty and you don't know where it is. So what you do is you try to rotate those parts. Um, yeah. And if uh, the dirt rotates with the eyepieces, then you know it's the eyepiece. Okay. Would you consider to upgrade your microscope with fluorescence capability in the future? Um, 
um, not this one in particular. Um, no, I have no plans. However, however, um, it is possible to experiment with uh, so-called autofluorescence. This basically means is you use um, a uh, an ultraviolet or blue light LED flashlight, and or you exchange the LED to do that, um, and then it is possible to make the chloroplasts of the algae shine red. So it is possible to do that. Uh, people have done that, um, but. Uh, I would not, for my purposes, I'm not going to upgrade to ultraviolet uh, light now um, because, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with what, what I've got here. Yeah? But I have experimented around uh, with so-called blue light excitation um, where I basically uh, used a blue light flashlight um, to make some of the chloroplast and some of the things shine red by autofluorescence. Yeah. Got my first microscope yesterday after watching your reviews. Had, had no specimens to observe, so look at some water from of my uh, uh, pl planters, and I spotted one rotifer was blown away. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Um, if you had infinite money, which light microscope would you buy? Honestly, if I had infinite money, um, I'd probably not buy a microscope. I'd probably I don't know, uh, invest a lot of this money into collecting interesting specimens. Um, because I would say that the microscopes that we have these days, also the regular light microscopes that we have these days, um, essentially are able to keep us busy and happily engaged for many, many years. And I think it is not always a question of the technical equipment in the microscope because uh, sometimes people wonder, well, what camera do you need and what microscope do you need in order to get the results that you get? And I'm saying, well, actually, um, it's sometimes it's not the camera. It's not the microscope, really. It is the way that the specimen is prepared. Right, um, and uh, this um, or some sometimes in uh, the post editing, so basically contrast enhancement in the video editing software and so on. So all of these things actually contribute quite a bit uh, to uh, uh, to the uh, to the image quality. So it's not always the microscope. Yeah? Uh, it's pretty cool to join live streams with you. This is my third live stream. Thank you for sharing. And I think I slowly have to stop because I'm talking now already over. I've never had a live stream that was over one hour, 40 minutes. I think this is the longest one ever. <laughs> have you ever tried um, plan? No, I have not tried those plan objectives, but those APO plan objectives, they must be quite expensive. APO chromatic objectives are very high quality objectives. Okay. Uh, okay. Follow your microbiome professor's advice and go skiing. <laughs> this, is <laughs> this is actually a, a comment in a video that I made some time ago. I remember when I started to study at university, um, that was my first semester, and I immediately went to the professor and said, oh, well, I'm so excited. I want to buy myself a new microscope, and what microscope should I buy? And the professor looked at me and said, you don't need a microscope. Go skiing instead with the money. And I was so disappointed with that kind of response. <laughs> Because I was so excited <laughs> and then you just say, ah, save your money. You don't need it. We got all of the lab equipment that we ever need here at university. <laughs> okay. So, but honestly, I, I really think that, um, um, uh, yeah, I highly recommend it uh, for nature observation. It doesn't matter if you want to look at, uh, at microscopic organisms or at, 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 at the stars and uh, astronomy. Um, I think it's, it's a very enriching hobby. For those people who like it, obviously, and, and therefore I do not fully agree with the comment of my professor who said, it's, ah, "You don't need a microscope for for research." Yeah, we're doing molecular biology anyway. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. So no, <laughs> I think it was. Uh, <laughs> I I I think uh, it was a good idea that I got my, myself a microscope in any case. Yeah. I thought of a warning you of a long time, but since I love this, <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, but this in photography. I'm quickly going through here because uh, if I had infinite cash, I would buy a scanning electron microscope. Honestly, yeah, that's that's that would be something interesting. But you see, with those electron microscopes, you do need a lot of training as well. Um, and that is something that I would buy myself as well. I would not only buy myself uh, um, a, a scanning electron microscope, but actually also a, a course where I would receive the uh, appropriate training. Yeah. 
I have really little experience. I bought myself a microscope and I don't know how to use the 40 times lens. I try to focus, but uh, one time it got so low that it broke. Yeah, you have to learn how to practice focusing. What you do is, is you have to slowly increase the magnification. Yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, basically uh, uh, you have to practice a little bit and uh, Generally, what ha uh, what is the case is that some of the mic or many of the microscope uh, high power microscope objectives, what they have is they have a, a front, they have a front uh, lens which is able a so called spring which is spring loaded which is able to retract so that you do not do too much damage. Yeah. So, folks, honestly, <laughs> this was uh, the longest live stream ever, um, and uh, um, yeah over here you see for those of you who joined in um, I was answering a lot of questions in the in the comment section while showing you some rotifers here uh, which I found in a water sample um, yeah and uh, I think I'm just just going to call it quits for today <laughs> because it has been already a very long live stream almost two hours can't believe it but that's fine uh, as long as we all like it uh, and as, as long as we're all enjoying it uh, but uh, then again, there are people from all over the world who are basically watching this in the middle of the night. And uh, yeah, I think uh, everyone does need a, a little bit of rest. I have no idea what this lemon shaped thing is. Could it be an egg um, of a rotifer? It could be. Yeah. Okay, folks. Uh, <laughs> I wish you all the best, folks. Uh, see you again next week. Uh, happy microbe hunting as always. Those of you who joined in late, um, you can watch the complete live stream after uh, YouTube uh, regenerated it and, and processed it. You can watch the whole live stream um, also on this uh, YouTube channel later on. Um, yeah, I wish you all the best again. Happy microbe hunting as always and uh, enjoy microscopy. See you next week. Bye-bye.